morning again, and uh, it's good to, good to have this opportunity to uh, worship together and to, to speak to you this morning. I uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to do so, and I uh, hope that we can do some things, share some things uh, that will be encouraging to you and uh, uplifting to you and, and reminding you of the tremendous hope that we have in Jesus but I'm going to start off with some kind of bad news, and I hate to start a sermon that way, but I um, you know, just want to start off by mentioning to you that <clears throat> I don't know if you've <clears throat> excuse, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't know if you've uh, noticed it or <clears throat> noticed it or not, um, but this world uh, is in quite a mess. This world's in a mess. I, I, don't, I know that you have noticed it. Of course, that's kind of uh, a facetious statement. But, you know, you, you just can't turn on any uh, source of information anymore without being aware that, that this world is in a mess. And, and that, you know, whether we're talking about things that are happening over uh, in other parts of the world, in the Middle East or Europe or Africa or somewhere else, or whether we're talking about what's happening in our country, there are a lot of things to be upset about. There are a lot of things to be concerned about. And, and it seems that in our society where we have developed to the point that we have this steady stream of information, uh, that we're just overwhelmed at times um, with all of the problems and the concerns and the things that are going on uh, in the world. And, and the reality is there, there are a lot of things about which to be depressed. Um, and because we receive those things so readily, if you turn on the radio or you scroll social media or you look at the internet or read the paper or turn the news on or do any of these things, you're just constantly bombarded with all of these things about which to be concerned and it can be depressing, and it is depressing for a lot of people. Even for a lot of Christians, uh, I think people have become depressed by this constant negativity and constant barrage of challenges in our world. I'm here to tell you this morning, to remind you this morning, of something that you already know, and that is that as Christians, our hope, our joy has absolutely nothing to do with what's happening in the Middle East or what's happening in the White House or any of those things. Our hope, our joy as Christians, our hope and joy as Christians is based upon some spiritual truths, some spiritual realities. And uh, I want to remind you of that this morning. Paul uh, says, uh-oh. I'm not advancing. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You may want to start it. Did you start it from the, the one that I'd put that? Because it's changed the font. I think it, if, if you just start it from the PowerPoint, then I'll be able to advance it that's on the screen. I, I want, I'll just read it to you. It'll be up here on the next slide in a moment. But First Peter uh, 1 and verse 3 um, Paul reminds us of the hope that we have and, and what it is that it's based upon. Uh, I said, Paul, Peter reminds us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Peter says we've been born again to a living hope. A living hope, and that hope is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, I realize what that says, and I realize how good that sounds, but I also live in this world, and I realize that folks will read that and they'll say, well, that makes a lot of sense, but look around and look at the mess that we're in. How can we be hopeful and joyful in the situation in which we live. Well, you know as well as I do that when these things were written, when Peter wrote this and when Paul wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice, things weren't real good in their day either. If you think about 
the Roman Empire and the things that were going on in Paul's day and Peter's day, things weren't very Christ-centered in their world either. And yet they're able to tell us, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And so this morning, I want to talk about the fact that while the news may be depressing, there is no need for despair. We should be concerned about the things that we see. We should do what we can to change the things that are wrong, the things that need improvement. But we should not lose hope because our hope is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because Christ was raised from the dead, and because Christ is coming again to raise us from the dead, we have a lot to live for and to look forward to, and it has nothing to do with what's going on in the rest of the world or the White House for that matter. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you would open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we're going to remind ourselves Uh, of this hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. And so we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and beginning in verse 12. Um, Let me see now, Emery, if it'll let it do it for me. Nope. All right, go ahead and click it one more time. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going to start with what Paul says Uh, about the reality of the fact that there are people who deny the concept of resurrection. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The reality is, the reality then and the reality now is that there are people who deny the concept of resurrection. There are people who say there is no resurrection. Matthew tells us in Matthew 22 and verse 23 that the Sadducees had that view. They denied the resurrection. And the reality is there are people uh, apparently here, even in the Corinthian church, who denied the resurrection. Paul said, how is it that some of you say that there is no resurrection? Well, the reality is, the situation is that resurrection scares people. The concept of resurrection can be a scary proposition because it involves accountability. Because it involves accountability. If we're going to be raised from the dead, then that means we're going to be held accountable for this life. And, um, you know, for unbelievers, that's a scary proposition for many Christians, That's a scary proposition when we don't comprehend forgiveness and what it means to be in Christ. But this concept of of resurrection can be a scary uh, proposition. And, um, you know, it's, I think, a natural tendency uh, then for folks to deny the resurrection. It's easier to simply believe that, that this life is all that there is sometimes than to contemplate what happens at resurrection. The problem with this is if there is no resurrection, there is no salvation and there is no eternal life. That's where Paul is going with this. And so let's read verses 13 through 19. Paul writes, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain Your faith also is vain. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we we witnessed against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. For For if the dead are not raised, then even Christ, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. Then all of those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we've hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most to be pitied. Paul says if there is no resurrection, then there are some consequences of that 
uh, of that uh, uh, of that doctrine, and the consequences are that that Christ hasn't been raised, and our our preaching is worthless, and our faith is worthless, and the, the, those who've died in Christ have perished, and and we are to be pitied if there is no resurrection. Once we deny the resurrection, then everything else fails. Everything hinges on the concept of resurrection from the dead. If we deny the resurrection, then we deny the system uh, that results in eternal life and salvation. If we deny the resurrection, we are left with really kind of a vicious cycle. And that's where people find themselves. On the one hand, folks want to deny the resurrection because that um, helps to, at least in your mind, avoid accountability. But on the other hand, if you deny the resurrection, if there is no resurrection, uh, we lose then the only opportunity that we have for real hope. We lose the only opportunity that we have for hope and we're left with what can often be depressing circumstances in the world in which we live. Now that was a problem then and, and it's a problem now. And so Paul uh, starts to address this here uh, in verse uh, 20. If you'll go ahead and advance it. Um, the good news is that Christ has been raised. The good news is, is that it's a historical fact that Christ has been raised. Uh, look in verse 20 if you will. Paul writes, but now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. He said, here's the good news. That may be bad news for those who don't want accountability, but for those of us in Christ, this is wonderful news. Paul says the good news is Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruit of the resurrection. And you know what? That's, that's true whether people believe it or not. No matter who believes it, no matter who denies it, there is a, it is a, an historical fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. It is an historical fact that he suffered and died on the cross, that his dead body was wrapped and placed in the tomb, and that on the third day, God raised him to life. That's an historical fact, and it doesn't matter who denies it or believes it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, Paul talks about that in the earlier part of this chapter. He writes, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and all the apostles, and last of all, as it were to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Paul said Jesus died, he was buried, and he was raised to life. And once he was raised to life, he appeared to many, many people, hundreds of people. And when Paul writes this, he says, many of them are still alive right now. You can go talk to the people that saw Jesus. Uh, over in Acts, Luke tells us that Jesus gave many convincing proofs to the people that he met after he was raised from the dead. Jesus died, he was buried, and it is an historical fact that he was raised from the dead on the third day. Not only was he raised, but he is reigning, Paul says. Look in verse 25 of 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. So Jesus has been raised from the dead, and Paul says he's continuing to reign. He's on the throne. He's reigning over his kingdom, which is the church, his people, and he's reigning today. Paul says he's putting enemies under his feet. And look at verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Jesus is reigning. Jesus is on the throne. He's putting enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be abolished is death. 
When is that going to happen? When is Jesus going to abolish death? Well, it's at our resurrection. It's when Jesus returns and raises us from the dead. We'll see that uh, here in a moment. Now, if not, if Jesus has not been raised and is not reigning, then we kind of get back to that vicious cycle I was talking about earlier. Look at verse 32. 1 Corinthians 15, 32, toward the end of 32. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You know, if, if there is no resurrection, uh, then we may as well just, you know, go for everything we can get out of this life, right? He says we eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We go for as much gusto as we can get in this life, if in fact this life is all that there is. If there's no resurrection, then we may as well simply pursue the things of this life. But the reality is, and you know this to be true as well as I do, that when your focus is upon pursuing the things of life, the things of this life, you find that you are never, ever satisfied. You're never, ever fulfilled. No matter what you pursue, no matter what you acquire, no matter what you can do to entertain yourself, to, to, to uh, enjoy in life, no matter how much of it you pile up or pursue, it is not ultimately fulfilling. It's never satisfying. Now, if we're in Christ, if we're spiritually minded, if we're pursuing after Christ, then we can enjoy the things of this life. I'm not saying that... Uh, we're not to enjoy the things of this life that God has created and God has made available to us. But the difference is in what we're pursuing. And if we're pursuing the things of this life, uh, then we will be unfulfilled every time. The good news is Jesus has been raised and he's reigning. And now finally, he's coming again to raise us. And this is what we see in 35 and following. Jesus is coming again to raise us eternally. You know, he's kind of been hinting at this in, uh, through chapter 15 as he talks about resurrection. He's kind of been hinting at our resurrection, but now he addresses it squarely and gives us some information about what's going to happen when Jesus returns and raises us and how it will be that uh, we will be with God eternally. Look at verse 35 to begin this discussion. Paul writes, But someone will say, How are the dead raised, and with what kind of body do they come? Now that's an interesting question. You know, at first he says there are some that deny the resurrection, some that don't want to believe in resurrection at all. That, that simply won't do. But if we believe in resurrection, then, you know, we start asking lots of questions. And, and I ask those questions. You probably ask those questions. What's, what's it going to be like? You know, uh, how's it going to be when we're, when we're with people uh, beyond the judgment, when we're in the presence of God eternally? What will it be like? What will we look like? What will we do? Uh, you know, what, oh, lots and lots of questions about that. And we just don't have answers to that. But Paul addresses this question about the body, uh, which is a reasonable question. You know, we say, well, you know, what will the body look like? We, we, we know that um, these bodies that we have wear out and ultimately pass away and we bury them and they return to dust. And we think, well, when the Lord returns, you know, how's that going to work? Uh, what kind of body will we have in the resurrection? People ask that question then, and, you know, we wonder about it now. But look at what Paul says, beginning in verse 36. He says, you fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. That which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Now, interesting thought that he, uh, that he makes here. He says, you know, you fool. He said, you, you're wondering about this body 
that, that dies and, and how it is that God's going to give you a new body, a different body. And, and he says, just think about planting a seed. He said, you sow a seed in the ground. And essentially what happens is you put that seed in the ground and it dies. And then life springs forth from that seed. As it dies, as it goes through that process, life comes forth from the seed. How that happens, nobody knows. You know, we can, we, can, we can study that and figure out if we put water at this time or fertilizer or this or that or the other, it might help, but nobody knows how God brings life from that dead seed. And Paul says, just think about it. You're taking a seed which has one body, it looks like a seed, and you're putting it in the ground, and God's bringing it to life in an entirely different body. It doesn't look anything like a seed anymore. You sow one body, God gives it life with another. Now, we can understand that. And then Paul says, you know, that's the way it is for us. Look in verse uh, 42 to 44. So it is, so also is, the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there's a natural body, there also is a spiritual body. Down in verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the earthy or the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Paul says, you know, just like you put that seed in the ground and it looks like a seed, God brings forth life in an entirely different body. He said, God can do that with you. You don't, you don't worry about that. You sow the earthly body, you sow the body that wears out and ages and gets disease and destruction and dies. He said, you don't worry about that. God can bring forth the body. God is able to bring forth life in a new body. And he says, as we die as, as mortal beings, we sow the natural. God raises the spiritual body. It's going to be a glorious day. Look at verse uh, 50. Uh, and what, what Paul writes about what's going to happen when the Lord returns. Now I say this, brethren, that, the, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. What a day it's going to be. Paul, Paul says that there's going to you know, there'll be this trumpet sound and these things are going to take place. You can look over in 1 Thessalonians 4 for another account of that. Uh, the things that are going to take place and, and the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And all of a sudden, the dead are going to raise, be raised imperishable. What will they look like? I don't know. Does it matter? No. Paul says, don't worry about that. God is able to raise them to life imperishable. And God is able then to change those who remain alive at that time from their mortal bodies into the immortal. God is able to do that. And uh, Paul is trying to encourage them uh, with those words. Look at verse uh, 53. For this perishable must put on the imperishable. And this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, watch this, then will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Remember what he said back in verse 26? He said the last enemy to be abolished is death. And I said, when, did that, when does that happen? It's at our resurrection. It's when Jesus comes and raises men and women from the dead. And, and that's what he's explaining now. He says, when, when Christ comes and the trumpet sounds and the archangel calls and God raises the, 
the people from the dead and the perishable, perishable become imperishable and the mortal become immortal. He says at that point we say this is the fulfillment of that statement, O oh, death, where is your sting? There is no more death. When Jesus was raised, Jesus was raised, Romans tells us, never to die again. You know, if you, if you think about it in the New Testament, there were, there were lots of people raised from the dead. <laughs> there, are, there are a lot of resurrections that take place in the New Testament. Um, you know, sometimes individual people and sometimes multiple people raised from the dead. Lots of illustrations or examples of that. But you know what all those people have in common, uh, different from Jesus, every one of those people had another funeral. Every one of those people died again. But Romans tells us Jesus was raised never to die again. That's the difference. That's why he's the first fruits. He wasn't the first one ever raised. He's the first fruits of the resurrection because he was raised never to die again. And what Paul is telling us here is that we'll be raised never to die again. We are mortal beings at this moment, but we will be raised immortal. We'll be raised never to die again. And this is the great hope that we have. This is why he says in verse 57, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the hope that we have. Has nothing to do with the depressing news on the internet. Has nothing to do with who occupies the White House. Has nothing to do with any of that. Though we might be concerned about all of that. Our hope has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And he's coming again for us. Look at the conclusion here in verse 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Paul says, knowing all of this, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead, knowing that, that he's coming back for us, knowing that we will become, uh, we will go from the, the, the perishable to the imperishable, knowing that we'll be with him eternally, knowing that our hope is based upon Jesus resurrection knowing that he says just be faithful just be just be steadfast just be immovable uh, just stand with the lord just just work for the lord knowing that your toil in the lord your work in the lord is not in vain it's really not in vain it's not as if those who want to deny the resurrection and say well we're just going to get what we can from this life or uh, you know, I feel like I'm just working myself to death and no point in it all. Paul says there is a point in working for the Lord. There is a point in being faithful. There is a point in being steadfast, knowing that your work for the Lord is not in vain. Our hope is based upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back to that First Peter 1, 3 verse. We've been born again to a living hope. We have this hope and it is based upon the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection. Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 talks about um, how it was that when we were baptized into Christ, we died with Christ through baptism, we were buried with him, and we were raised to walk in newness of life. In newness of life, there is a, there's a participation there in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And just as he died and was buried and was raised, uh, we, in a sense, die and are buried in the waters of baptism and then raised to walk in newness of life. Raised to walk with this living hope that we have in Jesus and his resurrection. I hope that you're a child of God this morning. I hope that you've uh, become a child of God and had your sins washed away. I hope that you understand the hope that we have. I, I, I desire for you to have that Confidence in that hope, because uh, I know as well as you do that all of this stuff that we see every day is, is really tough. And, uh, you know, it can really get a person down. But we have to remember as Christians that our hope is based upon Jesus and nothing else. If there's some way we can help you this morning, we'd love to do it. 
Uh, you can come forward uh, and let us know what that would be. Let's all stand together and sing.